right? Uh, almost 100% of the time, the error is not, is not from the scripture. The error is we start to listen to people rather than to what God has said. We're going to see this today in Nehemiah. The leadership in Jerusalem has allowed and ignored and even participated in blatant sin against God. They have begun to compromise on what the impact of sin is. They chose favor with the community and people rather than obeying God and being faithful to his commands. And we're going to see that Nehemiah is going to take responsibility for the situation, not blame, but responsibility to reform it. He's going to call out, correct, and then put protections in place for the people of God to live out a righteous and holy life according to what God has described. So this morning... The idea that we're going to focus on, the, the rally cry is this, the pursuit of holiness, which we're all engaged in, allows the church to identify, to guard against, and to repent from sin. Because remember, the word sin simply means missing the target, right? It means the target is here, God says to put it in that bullseye, but whenever we don't put it there, we've broken his law. We're, we're in sin. So we look at this section of scripture, and it's really in three large chunks. And the first part we're going to see is the corruption of the holy temple. So if you'll turn in your Bibles with me, we're in Nehemiah chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 4. And as you're turning there, just put your, put your mind in where we were last week. We just finished the dedication of the wall. And, uh, you know, they had this big worship event, right? People on top of the wall, they went into the temple uh, they dedicated it and all of these things. And uh, come on in, guys. Good to see y'all. Uh, it would. I'll be here next Sunday. Okay, no, you're, you're all good. And uh, we love you. Thank you for bringing her. Thank you. God bless. So, anyway, um, right. And so the end is they hear the word of God, right? They hear the word of God and they say, look, we looked in the law. We look at the law and we see that God doesn't want us to do certain things and they immediately repent from it. Well, now we're here in chapter 13, verse 4, and this is what it says. Now, before this, the priest, Eliashib, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was a relative of Tobiah and had prepared a large room for him where they had previously stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, and the tents of grain, the new wine and fresh oil that was prescribed for the Levites singers and gatekeepers, along with the contribution for the priests. So we know that the temple is supposed to be the place of ultimate religious purity in the Old Testament. It's not God didn't live there, but he chose that to be the place where he would meet humanity. That was the place he chose to have his name dwell, and it represented the otherness of God, the holiness of God. God directed and gave every rule regarding the proper use of this temple. And remember, the temple wasn't just a building. It wasn't just the temple itself, but it was also the courtyard around the temple, right? There was a gate around it. There were other rooms in other parts of this complex other than the actual temple where you would go into the holy place and the holy of holies. And so here we're seeing that. Uh, the temple uh, was a symbol of the separate holy nature of God, not only to the Jewish people, but also to the world. When the nations would come to Jerusalem, when they would see the temple, they would see that this is a unique place of worship that is far different from any other pagan or false worship center for false gods. And we see this priest Eliashib. Now, Eliashib is listed as the acting high priest. Some scholars think that it's a different Eliashib because why would the high priest be put in charge of the storerooms? That's a lesser job. But whether he is the same Eliashib or not, the high priest would have been aware, and so that's not really an issue here. So what did he do? He took Tobiah, the same Tobiah that was the enemy, right, in the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, the partner of Sanballat, they actively opposed the Israelites rebuilding the temple and the wall. Tobiah is not a Jew. He's a Gentile. He's an Ammonite. He's the same, uh, you know, people group that was just talked about in verses 1 to 3 last week about separating them from the population of Israel. And Eliashib has given him a house in the temple of God. Can you imagine if, uh, you know, Samuel got tired of living with us over there because we stink and we're, we're messy and he's just like, 
I need my own place. And we said, no worries, you can make the sanctuary your, your house. Just go ahead, man. Just move your stuff in, you know? You can make it a man cave. you got a big screen TV, right? We're going to have some, some fridges and all. I mean, that would be pretty offensive to most people. And this isn't even like a temple, right? Like, this isn't, this isn't holy in the way that was holy. And so this is what Eliashib allowed Tobiah to do. And, and listen, when he moves in, it's not just about, like, who does he think he is? He, he gets to have an apartment in this storehouse. <clears throat> it's what it represents. It represents that somehow this human, whether he's a God believer or, or a Gentile, thinks that he's on the same par to have his home in the very place that God said my presence would be. In the very place where if you go in the wrong room at the wrong time and you're not pure, God will strike you dead. Right? That's a big deal. But even more than that, he's in the room where they would store the offerings that was literally the way the Levites and the priests and the ministers to God's temple would use to survive. That's where their food was. That's where all the things they needed to perform the daily temple services were kept. Where are they going to keep it now? Well, then in verse 6 it says, While all this was happening, I, meaning Nehemiah, was not in Jerusalem. Because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. It was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done on behalf of Tobiah by providing him a room in the courts of God's house. Well, no wonder this happened. Would Nehemiah have allowed this to happen while he was there? I mean, it wouldn't be consistent with what we read about him earlier. So why is Nehemiah not there? Well, if you read closely, we see that he was in Jerusalem for 12 years. Okay, 12 years. We know that it took around 50 to 60 days-ish to complete the building of the wall. We don't know exactly how long after the dedication of the wall was. But he was in Jerusalem for a significant portion of time. And he was overseeing all of this. And so he has to honor the agreement he made with Artaxerxes in chapter 1. Right? Artaxerxes says, how long are you going to be gone? And he doesn't give a time, but he says, I'll return when I'm supposed to. So Nehemiah is showing his integrity here. He's honoring the word and the promise that he made. I guarantee he didn't want to go back. What God-fearing Jew would want to leave the promised land and the city of God and return? But I believe, and it doesn't say this implicitly, that he returned with an intent to leave again. I think he knew that there was still going to be some issues in, um, in Jerusalem. He's lived with these people for 12 years. He knows their character. He knows exactly what the, the tendencies are going to be. Spend a week with somebody, you know where they're going to go wrong, right? That's not a rocket science kind of issue. And so he goes there to fulfill his promise to the king, but his whole mind is, I need to get permission to go back. And he does. And when he comes back, what does he do? He identifies something, right? Wasn't that our point? The pursuit of holiness allows the church to identify sin, right? That's one of the things. And what does he identify? Not a mistake, evil. He doesn't even use the word sin. He says evil. Well, what is evil? Evil is anything that's opposed to what God wants. That's a big deal. So what does he do? Well, in verse 8 it says, I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room. I ordered that the rooms be purified. And I had the articles of the house of God restored there, along with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that because the portions for the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and the singers performing the service had gone back to his own field. Therefore, I rebuked the officials asking, why has the house of God been neglected? I gathered the Levites and singers together and stationed them at their posts. Then all Judah brought a tenth of the grain, new wine, and fresh oil into the storehouses. I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses the priest Shelemiah, the scribe Zadok and Padiah of the Levites with Hanan, son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, to assist them because they were considered trustworthy. They were responsible for the distribution to their colleagues. Remember me for this, my God, and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of my God and for its services. And so Nehemiah institutes immediate correction. Immediate correction. Sin is serious business. Rebelling against what God wants is a bad thing. And if we read scripture and we see how he dealt with people before Christ, 
we would be smart as well to move from sin as quickly as possible because it's a life and death situa situation. He throws Tobiah out. Sometimes I think of when I was a teenager and I angered my parents and they threw my stuff out on the yard and said, you're moving out. And then they would hug me and kiss me and bring me back in, right? But I think with Tobiah, this is permanent, right? This is permanent. Uh, isn't this a lot like Jesus when he cleansed the temple in the, in the Gospels? You know, Jesus enters Jerusalem. There's different accounts and different Gospels, but basically the summary is he comes in and he sees in the temple complex people selling things for profits. Uh, it's almost like a bazaar, a flea market. And what does he do? He comes in and he turns over the tables and he drives them out with a homemade whip that he makes. And he rebukes them and he says, get lost. This isn't what my father's house is made for. My father's house is made for worship and glorifying the God of the universe. Nehemiah is not Jesus, and he doesn't do it with the same authority, but he certainly makes that same point. Nothing unclean may enter God's house. This is a picture of what heaven looks like. This is why we need Jesus, because to enter into the real Holy of Holies, which is the heavenly realms, we need to be pure. We need to be perfect, and only through the work of Jesus can we be made perfect. So he rebukes the leaders. He says that he rebuked the officials as well. He's holding them accountable. And, and you know, here's the deal, guys. People compromise on sin all the time. We, we all do it and we're all guilty of it. Here's the leader, the priest, the head priest or whatever. It doesn't matter. The head, the head priest would have known if it wasn't him. And, and they're allowing this known criminal... Against God, Tobiah, the guy that tried to bring a military onslaught against the people of Israel, to sin in such a way that he would live in the temple complex. Look, can you imagine the effect that that had on the people? Oh, it's okay. He's kind of related to me. I mean, he's a nice guy. You know, like, all right, he doesn't really love God the way we do. But I mean, come on, everybody's kind of good, really, right? No, that's not the truth that we see in God's word. We're not generally good. We're all generally evil. And it's only because of the work of Christ in the gospel that we can be made right. So if the leaders, the religious leaders of Jerusalem, are going to compromise in such a major way, do you think that the folks underneath, the regular people, the Levites, the assistants, the general blue-collar guy that's working in a farm, do you think they're going to do the right thing and live a holy and righteous life? Probably not. Probably not. Listen, the next thing he does, so he kicks Tobiah out, and then he does something very important. Nehemiah restores the tithes to the Levites and to the priests. Why? Well, if you read the Old Testament much, you'll discover that they had no other means of feeding themselves except for the contributions given to the temple. That's what the tithe was for. The tithe was an act of worship for the giver, but it was real sustenance for the minister, right? Right? Without that tithe, they, they starve. So what happened here? Well, Tobiah moves into the storeroom. They can't store any of this stuff. You know, the leader doesn't care. So nobody else is like, well, why do I have to give my hard-earned stuff to the church, right? And so the Levites are like, well, I guess to survive, we got to go farm. And what's interesting is the Hebrew here, it doesn't mean that they just left. It means they fled. So that's an interesting thing. Like, they fled. They had to survive. If they didn't go farm for themselves, they're not going to eat. They can't store anything anywhere, and nobody's willing now to contribute because of the corruption that's instigated by the spiritual leaders. Nehemiah don't, doesn't only expel Tobiah, restore the tithe, make sure that it's right, but he puts controls in place. He said, okay, you guys did it wrong this time. Let me make it so that next time... There's a guard against doing that. That's what good leaders, good fathers, good God does for us, right? And so he appoints treasurers. No longer is one priest going to be in charge. There's going to be a system of accountability. Now we have four men representing the people of Israel. There's a priest, a scribe, a Levite, and a young intern, right? That last person's probably training to be a Levite. And so you have a multi-generational, cross-disciplinary group of people making sure that the goods are distributed the way they should. And not just as people want, but as the needs arise. Why? Because it's about glorifying God through the worship of God. And if the Levites can't do that, how can we do that? The spiritual leadership is key in the Old Testament. 
There is no Holy Spirit indwelt in the people at this time. They needed a priest in this time in God's history. So people needed to be constantly reminded of God's commands, of who he is and their responsibilities. They needed a visual reminder, and we see that in the temple complex, right? A visual display every day of how God wants his people to, to interact. They need a physical display. I mean, look at all the things that they had to do to be right with God. They had to bring their offerings and all of those Old Testament laws. And they need an audible reminder of God's holiness and their responsibilities as a covenantal people. Remember that the agreement that the people had in the Old Testament with God, that covenant was a quid pro quo arrangement, right? It was a this for that. It was, you love me, worship me, and do the things that I tell you to do, and I will bless you. But if you don't, if you sin against me, if you perform evil, I'm going to kill you. Literally, that's what it was. And so it's important that the people need to be reminded. And so when the, when the temple is not working right, when the worship of the, of the Israelites is not happening, when sin has crept in, not only does it affect the people doing the sin, but it is adversely and mortally affecting all of the people. Thank God that for Jesus, or for us, Jesus keeps this agreement for us, right? That, that agreement has not gone away. The new covenant is not a different covenant. It's an updated covenant based on the work of Christ. So thank God for us, Jesus keeps the agreement. Otherwise, we would always do what they did. The Holy Spirit changes us, and we are holy because of Christ. So we don't need a temple. We don't need a priest. We don't need to seal, see, feel, and touch. Because we have the Holy Spirit in us, 1 John from this morning, that testifies to the truth that we need to rely on Christ. That's good news for us, bad news for them. Bad news for them because they're in error. And when leadership sins, when leadership sets the wrong example, it enables sin in everybody else. So then Nehemiah sees that there is more corruption. In verse 15 it says, At that time I saw... The people of Judah were treading wine presses on the Sabbath day. They were also bringing in stores of grain and loading them on donkeys, along with wine, grapes, and figs. All kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I warned them against selling food on that day. The Tyrians living there were importing fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem. So these are your everyday people, right? And this isn't in Jerusalem. Remember, he's the governor of all of Judah. So he's traveling around. What's going on? I've been gone. We don't know how long, but it's probably been more than a year, right? So he's traveling around, and he's seeing all of this crazy stuff. Notice his reaction, number one, is not to be violent. He warns the people. I thought that was interesting because what it shows is he's putting responsibility where it's due. He knows, and I believe Nehemiah sees, that if the, the priest in Jerusalem is not towing the line, how can we expect these people to toe the line as well? And so he warns them because they're still responsible for their actions, but, but he's really after the root of the problem. The effects of sin are spreading throughout the people of Israel, not just isolated in the temple. And listen, what is the deal with this Sabbath focus, right? Why is it always a big deal? Like, why is God preaching about that? I rested on the seventh day, and so the Israelites have to do it. Why is it so important? Well, listen— the Sabbath is not really about rest like we think of rest. It's not about, oh, I don't have to do anything today. I can just sit at home and sleep all day long. I mean, we need sleep. Don't get me wrong. That's not, it's not less than that. Oh, my goodness, I said it, right? That's an inside joke for my family, right? It's not less than that. But what it is, what, what it truly is, is a day set aside to honor the, the, uh, the other commandments before the fourth. The Sabbath is the fourth commandment. So first of all, that's why it's important, number one. It's one of the Ten Commandments. If God said do it, we do it. But it also allows us to do the previous three, which deal with our relationship with God. Love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Don't have false idols. All of those things, right? And so the Sabbath is about resting from what we want to do or what we think we need to do. And the Sabbath is about focusing on the goodness of God. It's about being grateful for, in the Jews' uh, circumstance, a week of success, right? All the blessings they received in that week on the last day, they're thanking God for getting them through. 
It's, it's taking one day out of a whole week and saying, I'm not worried about my finances. I'm not worried about my house and it's falling disrepair, right? I'm not worried any about that. What I'm worried about is I want to know you, God. I want to display the first three commandments now on this day to you because you're worthy. And if it wasn't because of you, the past six days wouldn't have happened. That's why the Sabbath is important. It's about, it's about visibly, physically, and in real time trusting God. Why can't they cook? Why can't they do that? They're trusting for God's provision. Now, for Christians, this flips on its head. We know that we celebrate on the first day of the week because we know it's all finished. And so we're worshiping God in thanksgiving, trusting him for his provision, but as the beginning of the week. Because our command is not to behave, it's to go do. Our command is to go proclaim. You can't obey any of the other commandments if you're not obeying the Sabbath. If you're not obeying the Sabbath in the Old Testament uh, context, you can't be loving your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, right? Because you're not, you're not obeying it. You, you're worshiping a false god. Well, what do you mean? If I don't do the Sabbath, I still love God. Yeah, but guess what? You're worshiping yourself. You're your idol, right? Because what I want to do is more important than what God wants me to do. And those sins will lead to all of the other sins, right? Because the first part of the Ten Commandments is about our relationship with God. The rest is our relationship with one another. If we don't have our relationship with God right, we can't have our relationship with each other right. It just doesn't work. So Nehemiah rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same so that our God brought all this disaster on us and on the city? And now you are rekindling his anger against Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So he goes to the family leaders, those are the nobles. He rebukes them because they're in charge. They're the spiritual leader. How dare you not stop your uncle, sisters, aunts, uncle, cousins, right? Like, how do you not stop them from doing what is wrong? You know better. That's the message that they're getting. He holds them accountable. The leaders are not holding firm in light of spiritual leaders failing. Look, I don't care if the high priest is messing up. You know better. You do what's right. You know, we say as parents, you know, if your friend jumped off a bridge, would you? Right? Like, we need to have better maturity level in our faith, right? They needed to, too, and Nehemiah knows this. He's holding them accountable for not loving God enough to stop the compromise of sin in their families. He's holding them accountable for not remembering what they heard at the reading of the law. Isn't it the same people that were gathered in Jerusalem on several occasions in this book, heard the reading of the law, and they all agreed, yes, we're going to do what's right. And not so long later, it's like it never happened. And he calls sin evil because it is. And he reminds them of the consequences. Isn't this the same behavior that caused God to exile you into a land of pagan Gentiles? We're humans. We don't remember history, apparently, even true today. So then he puts some control measures in place for these folks, too. In verse 19, it says, When shadows began to fall on the city gates of Jerusalem just before the Sabbath, I gave orders that the city gates be closed and not opened until after the Sabbath. I posted some of my men at the gate so that no goods could enter during the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and those who sell all kinds of goods camped outside Jerusalem, but I warned them, why are you camping in front of the wall? If you do it again, I'll use force against you. After that, they did not come again on the Sabbath. Then I instructed the Levites to purify themselves and guard the city gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion according to the abundance of your faithful love. Leaders are called to protect people from sin. We are called to protect one another from sin. Nehemiah's whole aim is to remove the possibility of them breaking God's law within the city walls as much as he's able. Our job as, as Christians in our family is to provide protections in love for our families to not have the opportunity to sin. Shepherds also carry sticks, right? We need to remember that. A shepherd does not carry a stick as a nice accoutrement, right, to their shepherding. Look at my Gucci shepherd stick. It's diamond studded. For real, right? Like, he doesn't do that. 
That shepherd stick is for one purpose. It's for a sheep that won't listen. You put it around their neck, and you yank them to where you want them to go. Right? You yank them to where you want them to go. As spiritual leaders, we need to yank people sometime to where they need to be. Is that loving? Absolutely. Why is it loving? Because we're saving them from an eternity of punishment. We're saving them from consequences that they don't want to suffer. We're saving them from violating the law of the God of the universe. That is the most loving thing you can do. Now, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way. That's ten sermons, right, or more. But just keep that in mind. And, and so he goes in there. He sets this up. He's like, look, we're not even going to open the city gates. I'm going to give you a time and a place. We're only open for business. We are now Chick-fil-A. We don't open on Sundays. All right, if you lived in the South... It's the most frustrating thing in the world. When do you want Chick-fil-A? After church on Sunday. Why do we keep forgetting it's closed? Like the refrigerator. When you open it and you hope there's food that wasn't there before, you just keep showing up on Sunday hoping they're open, right? Doesn't work. And so, so he sets all this up and he makes sure there's not sinning. But now listen, at the end of these verses, he says something for a second time. It's this little prayer. Remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion according to the abundance of your faithful love. You know, when I first read this, I've got to admit, I'm like, man, he's a pretty prideful dude. Look at me, God. Remember how awesome I am. But you know what? As I read it and I prayed on it, I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is, remember that I'm doing the right thing and protecting you because people aren't going to like me so much. Right? That's important to get. When you stand for what's right in the kingdom of God, as long as it's what God wants and you're not doing it for your own means, when you stand for what is right, be prepared that you're going to come up against opposition. There are times in this church where I'm going to have to take a stand and say, we are not going to fill in the blank. Or we are going to fill in the blank. And when I do that, not everybody's going to like it. And I pray now that God, would, if it was what he wanted, would give me the strength to not bend to the, per, per, um, the uh, preferences of the people, but that I would stay truthful to what God's preferences are. And in our own daily lives, if we're living missionally like we've been trying to teach, if we're going out and sharing the gospel like we're learning on Wednesday night, if we're folding our faith into our lives, folks, we already have people in here that are being persecuted for it. We already have people in here that are possibly going to lose thousands of dollars and a spot in a college because they're holding to their beliefs. It's real. It's real. Nehemiah and every Christian, we need strength. We need strength to stand on God's promises and what is right. We need to remember that sometimes we're on an island in terms of the people and the world. People will turn on us in a split second because of our stance for Christ if it means that they're going to be put in an uncomfortable position. The decisions we make as Christians will not be popular. Nehemiah's were not popular. They wanted to go shopping on Sunday. Like, man, I need to go to the outlets. And he said no. He shut down their bank account. And listen, it's hard to sacrifice the praise of man for God's glory. It's hard. God knows I love to hear good job. I love it. I'm a performer. I was a musician before I did this. I grew up trying to go on a stage and perform music so that I would hear a rousing applause from the audience. That's not what Christ calls us to. Christ calls us to do things that are so contrary to the world that there's a deafening silence. At the best. And in the normal, it's rage against the truth of God. And we need to be able to stand firm in that. We need to hear all of this today. In verse 23, Nehemiah said, In those days I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or a language of one of the other peoples, but could not speak Hebrew. So here we go again, intermarrying, right? But don't get this mistaken. This is not about ethnic purity. This is not like Americans are better than Germans, right? So like don't marry a German or, or whatever. It's not about that. Remember, the Jews were an ethnically diverse people anyway. If you look at the history of, of the Israel nation, they intermarried all the time. They, they violated this rule, right? They're a mixed race anyway. They are a construct of God. They are a people God chose for his purposes. And remember, they represented, they represented a people set apart to glorify God, like Christians are today. And God said, don't marry 
foreign women. There was a purpose behind this. First of all, it was about religious purity. God knows best, and we have to understand that this is not racism either. And I want to just point that out. This isn't about race. It's not about discriminating against people. It's about marrying into the family people that are already in your family, in the family of God. My prayer and encouragement for my children is that they find believers to partner with. Right? There's instructions in the New Testament about the dangers and the remedies for a relationship that's believing and unbelieving. It's called being unequally yoked. And actually, one of the very, very few acceptable reasons to leave your marriage is because of an unbeliever that refuses to repent after you've done all that you can do. That's a, that's a real thing. And so we have, to, we have to see that. The immediate effects are apparent because they've intermarried. Remember that the priest was related to Tobiah. We're going to read later that there was actually some in-laws to the said priest because his kids married some outside of kids. Deuteronomy 6.68 says, These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. How does that apply? Well, that comes in the middle of the Ten Commandments, right? Remember, they intermarry, and now what happened? The kids don't speak Hebrew anymore. They're speaking the foreign tongues. What was the language of the law? Hebrew. What was the Torah written in? Hebrew. How can they do this? God said, teach your children. But my children don't know Hebrew. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's like the Catholic Church doing masses for centuries in Latin, and nobody knew Latin. You go to church. And everybody's talking in Latin, and you're just like, I'm here, God. Hope I'm doing the right thing. I mean, it's not, it's not logical. Nehemiah knows that this intermarriage is going to invite the worship of foreign gods. And that's the point. Because in verse 25, it says, I rebuked them, I cursed them, and I beat some of their men and pulled out their hair. I forced them to take an oath before God and said, you must not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters as wives for your sons or yourselves. Didn't King Solomon of Israel sin in matters like this? There was not a king like him among many nations. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Yet foreign women drew him into sin. Why then should we hear about you doing all of this terrible evil and acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? This is a harsh reaction. He physically assaults some of these people. I personally think it's because they argued with him. I don't think it was, uh, I'm going to beat you. I think it was he faced some serious opposition. You know, I mean, can you imagine telling somebody you have to divorce your wife that you might be madly in love with? That's some extreme stuff. And he curses them. What? Well, why? Well, why not? Remember the renewal covenant that we learned about in Nehemiah a few weeks ago? When all the people said, we're going to honor the rules of God and if not, curse us? They said that, not Nehemiah. Nehemiah, is, he's just doing what, what's supposed to be done. And he forces them to take an oath. Why? Because the stakes are high. This has happened before. Nehemiah was only needed to rebuild the walls because Israel already messed up this way. And it resulted in the complete destruction of God's city. When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord as God, as his father David had been. Solomon followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Tobiah is an Ammonite, isn't he? Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. That's 1 Kings 11, 4-6. The result was a divided kingdom and exile. Sin is serious. Anything that takes our worship away from Christ, we need to flee like it's, it's the coming new coronavirus pandemic, right? I mean, we can't run fast enough. Verse 28 says, Even one of the sons of Jehoiada... Son of the high priest Eliashib, here it comes, ready? Had become a son in law to Sambalot the Hornite? So I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, for defiling the priesthood 
as well as the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. I hope God does remember them. The leadership was totally compromised. No wonder Eliashib allowed Tobiah to come and live in the temple. They married into it. They matched up each other together. They literally married their mortal enemy. There was a conflict of interest on a cosmic proportion. This conflict of interest is like none other. You see, sin is like cockroaches. I grew up in row homes um, in Falkroth, Pennsylvania. We lived there. It was a dark time for our family. It was a financially dark period. It wasn't a very good neighborhood. And, you know, row homes are not townhomes. They're a little smaller. And uh, we lived right in the middle house, right? And there were like three or four on either side. And I didn't even know what a roach was until we moved in. And all of a sudden, one day, we had bunk beds. And I woke up, and I looked at the ceiling, and there was one of those little German cockroaches. And I hate bugs today. And I freaked out. And all of a sudden, we were seeing them everywhere. Like, we were infested. We were not a dirty household. So my parents, we called the exterminator. We're like, we're going to solve the problem, right? Got rid of the roaches. And then we watched as that same van showed up to the next house and the next and the next and the next. And guess where they came back to? Our house. So really, all the exterminator was doing was chasing them down the road <laughs> and chasing them right back. I mean, it was, it was unreal, right? But here's the thing. You would see one roach. And you'd be like, all right, squish, problem solved. But that always meant that you would see more. And then there would be more. And then more. Until you took care of the problem. That's what sin is. Sin starts with the smallest of sins. The smallest of little rebellious thoughts against God. And it won't stop there until you repent and put your faith in Christ. It will continue to grow and get so out of control that God literally destroys your nation, i.e. the nation of Israel. That's a real thing. What Nehemiah is showing that these people, these leaders, immediately disqualify themselves from being leaders, right? And we see that. In Nehemiah, verse 30 uh, to 31, it says, So I purified them from everything foreign and assigned specific duties to each of the priests and Levites. I also arranged for the donation of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, my God, with favor. So in verses 30 to 31, this is really a summary. Nehemiah, this is classic Old Testament writing. He's ending this section, and it's the end of the book. These are the last verses. Hooray! Right? <laughs> um, it's the ending. He summarizes what he did. I purified them from everything foreign and fixed the problem. Nehemiah identified the sin. He came back. He didn't compromise. He didn't just get along to get along. He didn't have a two-year plan to kind of manipulate people into doing the right thing. He identified it head on. He called it what it was, evil. He put systems in place to guard against future sin. And then he called God's people to repent, to turn from their behavior and to do what is right. This is a continuing pattern for Christians today. We see it first in the Reformation when Martin Luther was the old, well, he wasn't the first, but he's the most famous, that was willing to stand up to the mega power of the Roman Catholic Church and say, you're wrong. Talk about being on an island. And then that continued through the time of Charles Spurgeon with his famous letters about the downgrade and how Orthodox Christianity that had been you know, rescued from the Catholic Church and brought back to Scripture had now started to go backwards. Sin was creeping in again, right? And now today in every local church, if we're really honest, we're slipping all the time. We focus on things that aren't godly, and we focus on man-centered things. So what do we do? Well, we have to do what Nehemiah taught. We need to identify the problem. We need to be willing and brave enough to identify the sin in the church as a group. And once we identify it, we don't ignore it. We take steps to fix it and to eradicate it. We put the sin to death. What is, uh, uh, I think it's John Owen. I'm probably quoting the wrong Puritan, but he said, you know, be killing sin or sin be killing you, right? We need to constantly be putting it to death. Christ says you die to your old self and you live new. We have to keep killing ourselves, literally. Don't commit suicide. Kill our flesh. Kill the sin. Kill the temptation. And as a born-again Christian, we have to be in constant reflection and discernment individually about our own life. We have to continue to identify the patterns of sin that are, that, listen, that are present in our lives. We have to be willing to name it for what it is and to turn from it. 
And if you feel like you made it, Christian, if you're sitting here and you're like, I'm really good, I've got Jesus, I'm good to go, you have left the path, or maybe you didn't even start the journey. Because real Christians don't think they made it. They actually probably, if we're honest, feel worse about themselves the closer they get to God. Because when they see how holy God is and they get a better picture, they see how far short that they fall. Sin infects when we forget who we are. We're rebels. Ladies and gentlemen, we are rebels against our Creator. From the moment we're born until the moment we die, unless we put our faith in Christ, we are rebels against God. But the Word of God is the mirror that identifies the problem for us. We must guard and repent. Listen to what James says in the first chapter in the 22nd verse. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. Did we just talk about what kind of persons we are? But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. That works is not to earn salvation. That's identifying our issues, guarding against it, repenting to Jesus. Repent and believe. Life is a series of repentance and faith. That's all it is. So how do we conclude today? What do, what do we say? Well, first, believers must constantly put themselves to death. We just said that, right? I'm going to drive it home, identify the sin, guard against the sin, and repent from the sin to Christ. Do the unpopular thing of calling out sin, but know that man will hate it. You will lose peoples and allegiances. You will lose friends, influences, and prosperity, right? And Christ gives us the method in Matthew 18. You want to know how to biblically confront somebody about sin? Read Matthew chapter 18. It's all there. We are secure in Christ, but we have not made it. We need to remember this. Born again means not just knowing Jesus, but following Jesus. It's a journey. Trusting Jesus for our very eternal existence. And we have to remember that this isn't an effort, but it's a desire. Right? It's a desire. And the fruit of that desire is salvation. What is this doctrine of salvation? We need to know this. It's that Christ does not make us sinless. We committed those sins but that he paid the price for the penalty of our sin. And because he did that, the Father promises to wipe it from his memory. So it's not that it makes us sinless, we will still continue to sin in our flesh, but it pardons us from the, from the, from the uh, consequence of that sin. So what does that mean? It means that we're not just saved on one day. We are saved when we turn to Christ, but we're also being saved right now, aren't we? We're progressively being saved. We're progressively being sanctified. And then finally, on that day when we meet Christ, we will be finally saved, glorified in Him. So in light of all of this, we must always identify sin, guard against sin, and repent from sin. And we repent and guard and identify so that we can turn to Jesus and the grace found only in the cross. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the journey that you've allowed us to go on for the past 15 weeks. We thank you for the mistakes that you've forgiven us for. We thank you for the forgiveness, not the mistakes, Lord. Uh, we thank you that you allow us to repent. We thank you that the Holy Spirit in us testifies to the truth, and it calls us back to you. We thank you, Lord, that when we do go astray, that you're the good shepherd that will leave everyone else and come find us again. Lord, salvation is your business. Our business is obedience. You call us to you, and we respond because we can't help it. You're the God of the universe. You are sovereign and holy. There's nothing that's out of your purview or control. And so, Lord, I just pray at the end of this sermon and the sermon series that you would help us remember the lessons that you have given us in Nehemiah. Help us recall the truths. And not just so we can live a better life of comfort, but that we could revive your church because that's what we're here for. We are born again to serve your kingdom, not ourselves. Lord, help us to do what you have instructed us to do. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.